That sounds right. Um, and we'll get started. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this is a installment of our Paddle Tales series. Nice play off of our club's name, Paddle Trails. Um, but we started this uh, during the pandemic to kind of stay connected and engaged in paddling. Um, and it turned out to be a pretty, pretty big hit. This, I think this is our eighth or ninth or something like that um, paddle tales. So uh, I'll put the link in the chat to our other past ones if people are curious and have some extra time. Um, but yeah, basically, it's just a chance for paddle trails members and guests and friends and acquaintances to share some stories about paddling trips they've been on so we can kind of uh, live a little bit through them. Um, a couple quick housekeeping things, then I'll turn it over to Anne to introduce Amos. Um, but uh, as we saw a little bit, um, try to keep yourself muted if you can during the uh, presentation. If things get out of hand, I think I have the ability to mute you, so I may use that if I have to. Um, watch out. Um, and also, maybe Amos, I'll just ask you when you start to let people know if you'd like questions throughout or if you want to save them for the end, um, just so we can kind of stay on track for the most part. Um, and I think that's about it. So I will, I think I've got screen sharing enabled. I'll turn it over to Anne and then we'll give Amos a second to get screen sharing. And if we have an issue, we'll, we'll deal with it. But for now, uh, thanks for coming everybody. And I'll turn it over to Anne. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Anne and I, um, I live in Seattle and I help to do some of the quiet water trips and in particular the women's paddles and some of the real family friendly like paddle a quarter mile to Agua Verde for a burrito and back sort of trips. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce Amos Kaloji, who I've known since for his whole entire life because his mom was my boss when I was a Girl Scout canoe guide um, for quite a few years. So it's been fun to see Amos grow up and um, be a guide for the Boy Scouts for several years and work kind of up through the ranks there. And then um, I was so excited to hear that he and five of his friends who were also Boy Scout, uh, or Scouts BSA, uh, canoe guides decided to um, embark on the adventure of a lifetime, one of many, I'm sure for Amos, um, where uh, they paddled from Lake Superior all the way to Hudson's Bay, paddled in Portage. And um, I saw them talk at Canoe Copia a couple, a month ago. And I was just so impressed with um, how organized and uh, cooperative they were in figuring out how to, to embark on an expedition of this um, length and uh, duration. And um, so anyway, so I'm really excited to have him talk today, but I will say it was my husband, Scott, who organized it. And I just said, hey, let me introduce him. But uh, the whole family is here watching because we love, we love to hear about your latest adventures. Well, thank you, Anne. I'm really excited to be here, folks. Can everybody hear me okay? A little thumbs up or thumbs down if not. Um, so as Anne said, my name is Amos Kloji. I'm actually in northern Minnesota right now. I could prove it to you by showing you the snow. I don't know how it is in in, uh, in this out west, but uh, we did have 70 degrees last week, and now we are back to snow and 18 degrees in the morning. It's been a while since I've used Zoom, so let's see if my old college skills are still there. Can everybody see my screen? All right. That's good. All right. Well, folks, I'm very excited to be able to talk to you folks about the trip I did this summer. Um, the group I was with, we called ourselves the Vagabond Voyageurs. And this summer, we paddled from Grand Portage, Lake Superior to the Hudson Bay. And I heard that this paddling group is whitewater, but mostly some flatwater, whitewater enthusiasts. So this trip's got a little bit of it all. And that's one reason why I really, really loved it. Now, I'm going to preface this. Then we're going to try to hold questions to the end. Um, please bear with me if I if I ramble a little bit too much. I'll try to keep it uh, moving. And the last point is to please remember that this was a learning trip for everybody on it. It was really, really great. Man, the scenery changed so much. We learned so much along the way. Um, because before this trip, uh, the longest trip any of us had been on canoe-wise was 14 days. And other than that, only two of us had done a 14-day canoe trip. We we're all really experienced with youth guiding in the Boundary Waters for about a week. So this was a big push. So this summer... The six of us went ahead. We paddled 88 days, 1,200 miles. It took three main rivers, covered two countries. It required six months of planning, eight food resupplies, and we used 13 packs, three beat-up canoes, and six lifelong friends. And here we all are. In the top left is Chrissy Turk with a canoe on her head. Chrissy is from Southern Florida. 
All right. In the middle is Elijah Griner. Elijah is from the South Loop of Chicago. There on the top right, I'm from Hibbing, Minnesota, Bob Dylan's hometown. Woo. Bottom left is Josh Lambert. Josh is from Cleveland, Ohio. In the bottom middle is Jackie McDougal. She's from Connecticut, way out east. And on the bottom right, although it looks like an in memoriam, it's not. Hunter's doing great. Hunter's from Missouri. So you might ask what brings a bunch of, you know, six kind of ragamuffins from all over the country together. Well, it was Ely, Minnesota, right? Um, we were all working guiding youth trips for the scouts. Uh, in particular, we'd all worked a couple summers together, but this winter, or sorry, last winter, we all worked together in the same space. And truly what happened is we had too much time on our hands. So I don't know how many of you folks have employees or might be having employees, um, but don't give them too much time off. I know, you know that there's some laws about that, but they gave us a little bit too much time. We said, what should we do this summer? Well, a couple summers ago, we all paddled you know, from I Falls to Lake Superior, kind of the top border of Minnesota. So of course we should paddle to the Hudson Bay next, kind of linking up this historic um, different fur trade routes. And we said, yeah, of course, why wouldn't we? We're done with college. What else should we be doing? Let's do it. And so we started our planning. Luckily with all of us being together for that winter, we were able to get a lot of work done pretty quickly with six of us. We were able to break up the tasks. Part of those tasks, we were really fortunate that we got a lot of help for our trip, right? Um, including some some sponsorships. Brainstorm Bakery is a local bakery in town. Wintergreen Winter Gear, maybe some of you folks are familiar with. Really awesome company. They gave us some crunch caps for the trip. Tovo gave us some epoxy. And the Ely Mitten Project gave us some great support and some fort bags. So um, the cool thing about paddling is there's a really cool paddling community, right? And paddlers really like to help paddlers do cool trips. And that's what we just found more and more and more on the whole trip was the impact that people made on our trip, either before the trip or during or after. Now, like I said, it took us six months to plan. For the last two weeks of those six months, we decided to go to my parents' house in Hibbing, thanks to my parents for letting us crash the basement, because we just had a couple tasks to take care of. Here is a list of a couple tasks. We had to install some uh, snaps on canoes. We had a epoxy canoe, whole lot of stuff we had to do there. We had to do some target practice with our shotgun for polar bears. We also had to learn how to whitewater canoe. Um, all of us, none of us, but two to three of us have ever whitewater canoed. And so we decided, well, you should, we should at least have one day of practice before we do a remote trip with some whitewater. So there was a lot to do in those two weeks, but luckily again, six people and being young, young helped a lot. We we're able to kind of power through it. Here we are. Um, we made two of the three spray skirts for our trip. And luckily enough, thanks to other paddlers got given a skirt. And when I said we, I mean, my mother made the spray skirts for the trip and we helped a lot. Target practice, spraying maps to try to waterproof them. What we did um, because of all the support we got is we wrote the names of everybody who helped us on our trip on one of the canoes that came to the bay with us. And here it is, a pretty old beat up Champlain. And there's Josh adding names. We thought we'd be done adding names, but throughout the trip, they just kept growing. And here it is. Here is all the gear that we would have and the only gear that we would have for the next two and a half months all beautiful and laid up. The spray skirts are unbleached. The canoes are unscratched. The paddles are unsplit, you know, and the pots aren't even blackened yet. Um, and a whole lot was about to change. So the first part of our trip was following the Minnesota border, right? And it was really cool because that first part, most of us had done before. Here we are on the shores of Lake Superior. We didn't paddle this lake, so we're not going to include it in the biggest body of water we paddled. But this is the biggest body of water of the trip so far. All started. Now, I don't know what you guys heard about Minnesota this year. Um, the Grand Portage, Nine Mile Portage, luckily, because of excessive flooding in 2022, um, half of the Grand Portage was closed. So we only had to do five and a half miles. So that was great. Here's how that went. With the flooding also came poor portage maintenance. I don't know how many folks have done portage trips, but a first day food pack, pretty heavy. So props to Jackie for being able to, uh, to do some shimming under some of the logs with those first day food packs. At the end of our first long, hard day, we were we were camped under a bug zone um, at the end, you know, all feeling a little bit maybe nervous about this trip. But the cool thing about trips is all the planning you're anxious about, right? And as soon as you hit the trail, you hit the water, then all the nerves go away. So honestly, this this night together, eating our first dinner of many on trail, um, everybody was really excited and just happy to be out there. And Gus accompanied us for about two weeks. That's the little black dog. Those flood waters gave us some awesome sites, including the um, Partridge Falls on the Pigeon River. Two years ago, we did the same trip backwards for the, you know, the first half. We did the Minnesota border, um, and we almost walked by this waterfall because it wasn't that big. And I mean, look at this. This is fantastic, right? Um, so those flood waters, man, we kept getting rewarded with sites like this. We also had to paddle up this river. 
but the only river we had to paddle up because Minnesota is really cool. We have three watersheds in it, right? One goes to the St. Lawrence, the, you know, the Great Lakes. One goes to the, via the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico, and one goes to the Hudson Bay. And about 20 miles into our trip, 30 miles into our trip, we were on the one going to the bay. That first day on the, the Pigeon River, we, we had a lot of wind. There was white caps on this river, and the river was maybe, maybe, I don't know, not even 100 yards wide. It's not a big river at all, and there are white caps coming at us. So we took the times we could in the little brush to appreciate some, some, uh, some breaks on our first day. Honestly, as you can see here, we were feeling a little bit trepidatious. So this is South Fowl Lake. And way down there, this is a giant cliff. You see a bunch of little white spots. Those are white caps. I'm sorry, we're not used to paddling on the ocean. Um, you know, here in Minnesota, we were we were pretty pretty tired at this point and pretty kind of beat up by the nine mile portage, by paddling upstream on the pigeon, by all this wind. And it was day two of our trip, and we were all kind of like, "Gosh, is this the way we should be starting an 88 day trip? I don't know." Um, but again, the great thing about wilderness trips is it rewards you with stuff like this, right? And when it gets windy, what do you do? You wake up early. And when you wake up early, a couple things happen. You beat the wind, you beat the heat, you beat the people, and you get, you know, you get to see the lakes that maybe their best time. Because we were in the boundary waters, we were going through lakes that we were really familiar with, as that's where we had all guided. And it was really satisfying to go through this place with friends who we've all paddled with youth on different occasions. Um, and even have the chance to see some of our friends who were still guiding as we were starting this trip of our lifetimes. So this is Elijah, uh, who met his brother on trail, who was guiding a trip for the Boy Scout base. And they were able to say, you know, hi and bye for the first, last time and for two months. And that was really cool to be able to see. Other friends, this was our first resupply, was in the Boundary Waters. Two of our friends came up from Ely and not only brought us the food we needed for the next couple of weeks, but also made us a really awesome breakfast. So here's James. Um, so again, the story of this wilderness remote northern trip really was the people that helped us along the way, whether we knew about them or asked for it or not. It was really incredible. Here we are saying goodbye to them and continuing on the boundary waters. Again, the flood waters, as we followed them along to the bay, kept giving us just these remarkable waterfalls, right? Really, really, really just fantastic views. Um, beautiful paddling, right? Man, it made us yeah, really remember why the boundary waters is such a special place. It also ruined a lot of our campsites. I uh, don't know how many folks have been to the Boundary Waters. This fire grate's usually about two feet off the ground. It's completely covered in flood debris. This entire campsite, this is on Loch LaCroix, and we checked out 10 campsites. Nine of them were almost completely unusable because of the flood. And here we are also on Loch LaCroix. It was our last day in the Boundary Waters. And you can see the skirts are on. Skirts are on for the first time. Those skirts were a lifesaver in a lot of ways, partly because of our inexperience, partly because, man, they just, they changed, um, they changed our margin of error so much. And this last day in the Boundary Waters, we're almost joking, the Boundary Waters didn't want us to forget where we came from, right? We had these big plans to go paddle these, these northern rivers, paddle all of Lake Winnipeg, Lock LaCroix, yeah, this is nothing. And just wanted to remind us, you know, a little bit of a humility check and some good practice that the lakes can turn nasty pretty quick. We got out of the Boundary Waters into Voyager National Park, a pretty big landmark for us because meant bigger lakes. The biggest lake of the trip so far was Rainy Lake. Rainy Lake is usually this just, just torrentious, you know, winds and, and rain and motorboats and houseboats zooming past you. It's just can be really sketchy to paddle. Um, and here we are paddling across Rainy Lake and it is just glass. And so what do you do when the biggest lake of your trip so far is just glass and you didn't expect it? You just keep paddling and paddling and paddling. And we ended up in International Falls a day early. And this man, his name is, is um, Frank Edwards. He reached out to us on Facebook, just heard about the trip and said, hey, if you guys are passing through International Falls, we'd love for you to stay in my backyard. Uh, his only Facebook picture was a polar bear. And we thought, well, maybe it's a polar bear, but that's okay. We need to learn some more about polar bears anyways for the farther part of this trip. And Frank was just the sweetest old guy. And he was trying to take our canoes and go, no, Frank, we have to portage. You don't get it. Like, we have to do this. He's like, I'll take your bags. We're like, well, all right. Um, so we portaged through the main street of International Falls. A couple of things happen when you portage through a city. Number one, you get some odd looks and a lot of jokes of where are you going. You also get a lot of offers of places to stay. Again, the theme of this trip being the people. I mean, like four people offers, oh, do you need a backyard to stay? Well, we're actually going to one right now. Frank, oh yeah, we know Frank. Of course you do, right? It's his eye falls. Um, also, just you feel pretty cool portaging under streetlights. 
while in I Falls, we resupplied. We got some more of our gear for the trip, and we had our first of many trail birthdays. This was Chrissy's trail birthday. And then we hit the Rainy River. So this trip covered a lot of distance. Um, it also covered a lot of really different landscapes, boundary waters, big, beautiful, rocky shorelines, you know, just wilderness environment, and then switched into Voyager National Park's big, big, big water. Then the Rainy River, half farmland, half Canadian Shield, and half kind of industry. Um, so it was really cool. It kept it really fresh for us to kind of have the landscape change that much. And those floodwaters that we were talking about, man, they pushed us along. We thought we were going to have such a long day on the Rainy River, and we were just zooming. Um, there are some cows we saw along our way just to show how much it changes from beautiful white pines to cows. And you could smell them from a ways away, too. And here we are crossing into Ontario. This is in Baudette, Minnesota. A couple of things happened here. We crossed the border legally. That was pretty cool. Um, they didn't look at any of our stuff. We went through all the effort because, again, trip of learning. Sure, we thought we could paddle over to their dock, but we wanted to be sure. So we portaged over the big bridge in Baudette with all of our gear, set it all down, made sure it was really close to their little outpost so they could come check it out. And the guy was like, that's fine. I'm like, really? Oh, okay. He looked us all in the eye and said, do you have any chicken or milk? And we're like, no, no chicken or milk. He's like, all right, welcome. Welcome to Canada. However, we plan to bring a shotgun. You saw Chrissy practicing with that earlier because there's a chance of polar bears the last couple of days of this trip. We talked a lot about it and discussed a lot about it. In the end, decided to bring it. We thought we had all of our paperwork in order. We got to the Canadian border and they said, sorry, you can't bring that across. So right before this is where we said goodbye to our shotgun and all had a little bit more of a, a worry in our stomach. But nevertheless, we kept going and it was, yeah, it was a really great feeling to officially be in Canada. So I, can you folks see my mouse? I'm not sure. Okay. Sir National Falls is right here. This is the Rainy River. We cross the border right about here, heading towards yet another biggest lake of the trip so far. And here we are on that lake, Lake of the Woods. Lake of the Woods, man, I would paddle any part of that trip again for the most part. And Lake of the Woods especially. It changed so much. This is the southern section of Lake of the Woods. And it just looked like barrier islands like the Florida coast. Now here's Chrissy from South Florida feeling very much at home. And as you kept paddling farther north, you just got these big expansive views. Um, it, was, it was a really big lake and just these beautiful, beautiful kind of swampy shores turning into these weird archipelagos of twisting island chains with big rocky outcroppings. And then the scenes that look just like the northern Quetico, a Canadian provincial park. Um, so really the, the lake just changed so much. It was one of my favorite parts of the trip. Now at the end of Lake of the Woods is this little town called Kenora, Ontario. Uh, some folks call Kenora the Venice of the North by some folks. I mean, we did. Nobody else there did. We thought it was fantastic because there's rivers coming in and out of the city, um, which you can take like we did to where we stayed that night and to the grocery store. There's docks specifically made for motorboats that come to the grocery store in Kenora. So the little Venice of the North, it was fantastic. It was one of the easiest resupplies we did because we could paddle to the grocery store. Um, the other things that happened in Kenora, is we met some really, really, really helpful people. So we've talked about the floods, right? Minnesota, they're pretty bad. Farther north, on we were about to be entering the Winnipeg River. And again, we were all really inexperienced with white water for the most part. Winnipeg River had some white water. This last year, it had a lot of white water. It was record um, water levels. All the hydro dams, the hydroelectric dams were wide open, which caused unpredictable rapids. It caused rapids that didn't used to exist. It also caused the river itself to change direction in, in a couple places. So the maps we had, even though they were a year old, were outdated for this summer. So this man here, um, his partner runs the Path of the Paddle organization, which is a water route from in uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario, to kind of the Manitoba border. He said, hey, can I come show you guys some maps? We're like, oh, absolutely, Garth. That'd be really cool. Thank you. He showed up. He was talking to us. And he said, you know, we have a group um, as ambassadors for us paddling the route right now. We're like, oh, like, where are they? They're, they'll be here tomorrow. Um, do you want to talk to them? Like, yeah, we would really like to talk to them. So then the next day, uh, these Canadian cartoons showed up. This is David Jackson. At the time, we assumed he might be 10 feet tall. Um, I mean, really, truly, these, these people come out of these boats, with these giant bags and these thick, thick Canadian accents. And they were just the nicest folks. And then he proceeded to terrify all of us because he just paddled up the Winnipeg River. He laid these maps out with us. He goes, oh, this river. Oh, that's really, really gnarly section. Oh, yeah, that's like way worse than it ever used to be. I don't know, blah, 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 blah. And kept pointing, us, pointing out the parts to us. But luckily, 
uh, he could see the fear growing in our eyes that he stopped and him and his, his now wife looked at us and they said, you know, guys, you're going to be able to manage it, right? Like any wilderness trip, like you folks know about tripping, the great part is you can't look that far ahead. When you're in the moment and something's actually happening, all you can do is get through that moment, right? And the beautiful part about that is um, you can't overthink it. You just can't, right? When you're in a rapid or you're at a weird bushwhacking portage or you're at you know, a dam that you didn't think was there, that's the only thing you have to worry about and you're going to worry about. And so they sat us down and just said, look, guys, just take it one thing at a time. We know that seems simple, right? But the most simple truths aren't, you know, aren't original, but they still matter. And they kind of said the same piece of advice we heard again, um, you know, when it comes, when it comes down to it, just try to point downstream and paddle. And as simple as that sounds, it was weirdly helpful. Um, so here we were starting a, a section of the trip that we were all the most worried about. Uh, leading into Lake Winnipeg, right? The Winnipeg River, now we were all officially out of our comfort zones, which is the best part of a trip. You're out of your comfort zone, that's when you grow the most. So we left the Venice of the North in one of these beautiful canals. And soon that night encountered our first huge thunderstorm and hailstorm and it was just whipping and we're cooking under the dining fly for the first time of the trip. And honestly, uh, this was the perfect thing to happen for us that night. All of us were already kind of terrified and nervous. And then this storm came by and we were able to handle it. And we laughed and we sang, we had a good time. And we remembered, you know, that's the beautiful part about wilderness trips, right? Um, you get moments like this and they're fun because you're out there because you get to see what's happening and you can handle it, right? If you're prepared and you're with a group of folks that you trust, even if you're not all completely um, up to the same level on a subject, you can work together and you can really help each other's shortcomings. The next day we hit our first rapid. Those of you that know whitewater, this doesn't look like much, does it, right? It wasn't, um, but we were really, really new. And the worst part was a thunderstorm hit right about now. So we were like, all right, guys, let's get in the boats. We know what we're gonna do. This is gonna be our line. Um, and then a thunderstorm hit. So we had to sit and look at our first rapid for about an hour. And there is nothing worse than sitting and watching the thing, you know, you just want to get over with happen. And again, this is Chrissy and Josh after the rapid, really awesome, easy rapid, so much fun. Look at those two, they're having so much fun, right? Here's the same rapid. Uh, as you can see, Jackie in the front looks like she's about to die. And I'm in the back looking like I might kill something. And it was so easy, it was a straight line. We learned so much is all I'm saying on this trip. Man, did we learn a lot. Um, this was a feature of the river that we were just talking about. This was completely unmarked on all of our maps. But because the water level was so high, these were about five, six foot standing waves. And I promise I'm not exaggerating. There's not a good picture of it, but this whole section was not marked on any of the maps. But again, you get to a challenge and what do you do? You just figure it out, right? So we portaged as much as we could. We lined a little bit and then we had to run the last section. And, and although we're not really familiar with water still, it was really spooky. Um, I'm familiar with swells, and after Lake Winnipeg, I'm very familiar with swells, but this was not swells. At the end of the rapid where we saw the paddle, the whole water table was rising and lowering. So as we were lining our boats, the boats would come up to about your chest and they'd slam down below your knees and come up to about your chest and slam down. And it was just because the force of water moving through this choke point, right? But it was just really unpredictable. Um, so that was, for me, the scariest part of the whole trip. But man, did we learn a lot. It was so beautiful, it was so cool. Um, here's Elijah on the same rapid working his way around. The Winnipeg River was really beautiful and really interesting, just mix. On the Winnipeg River, we crossed in the Manitoba. Rules were a little bit different in Manitoba. It was a really beautiful place with some awesome people. Their sign needs a little bit of revamping. though. This was our first night campsite in Manitoba on the Winnipeg River. The Manitoba section also gave us a lot of these beautiful chains of lakes that looked again like the northern Quetico, like these beautiful lakes we were familiar with. Also gave us a lot of people. These people were tubing. There's about a hundred of them. So it felt like we were playing Mario Kart, dobbing these tubists as we were paddling down this little channel off the Winnipeg River. It also gave us a lot of hydro dams. Um, the Winnipeg River is, is fairly well dammed. Um, it was the only dammed river of our trip, which was pretty nice. But again, they were wide open. So all the spillways were just, just really cool to see. But again, kind of scary because the portage put-ins, we had to change a little bit. Speaking of portages, the Winnipeg River had some interesting ones. Some normal rocky, you know, beautiful stumbly portages, some road portages around those dams. Some portages through what seemed like just the middle of nowhere, which it kind of was. And then some portages around some old dams. And again, uh, this section here, is when I referred to the section of the river that changed direction was called the cut. 
Um, and so we got to the river and we looked at our maps and we said, this does not make sense at all. And we found a way through a swamp to avoid some rapids we weren't comfortable with, found some great cattails along the way, and ended up in this little tiny town called Great Falls. And again, if you remember the lesson from earlier, when you portage through a town, a couple things happen. You feel really cool, people ask you questions, and you get offers of places to stay. So we were just trying to get through. This town was only there for the dam. Manitoba Hydro, Hydro as a lot of people just refer to it as, was the main industry on this trip that we saw. This town was made just for the hydro dam that was there. It's called Great Falls. There's about 46 houses. How do I know? They're numbered. And by the end of the night, we met everybody in that town. So we were walking through, and the shirtless Canadian man up here was smoking a cigarette. It was about 6.30 in the morning. And he goes, you guys need a place to stay? And we're like, no, you know, we're fine. We're just coming through. And then it started pouring and thunder. He's like, you guys can just stay under my tarp. And finally, we took him up on it. We ended up staying for a whole night. And it was the most degenerate, wholesome thing I've ever experienced. We ended up calling it the Great Falls Rendezvous. So this, this man's name is Guy, G-U-Y. He tried telling us it was French. We thought he was just messing with us. No, your name is Guy, buddy. Come on. But Guy was an interesting person, to say the least. And we didn't realize it, but he was having a like reunion of friends that weekend, as well as making their own whiskey that weekend. Because all of a sudden, as we were sitting under this big tarp in his backyard, shirtless, large Canadian men just kept coming out of his house, like three and four and five. And then people came out of the camp and we're all like, should we be here? And they're all in, in true Manitoban style, came and sat down right next to you, said, hey, what are you doing? We're like, oh, we're paddling from Minnesota to the, to the Hudson Bay. They're like, cool, right on. You want some eggs? And we're like, yeah, you're not phased by six random people. Okay, cool. But uh, they were just the sweetest folks. They gave us so much great advice, so many laughs. Um, yeah, just really, really, really awesome down-to-earth folks. The Great Falls Rendezvous was a highlight of the trip. And again, a reminder and a surprise of how much people impacted our trip. One of the people, Trent, we actually ended up seeing again. Uh, he said, oh, you guys are ending in Gillum. Do you need a place to stay? We said, yeah, we do, but we'll figure it out. He said, oh, I have a house. You could say they were like, sure, we'll never hear from him again, right? We got his number. And we thought, all right, maybe in a month, you know, we'll see Trent again. Who knows? The next day paddling through, uh, another family reached out to us. We were not looking for places to stay, but someone put us on, on Facebook in the area. And this little family that owned a farm on the side of the Winnipeg River asked us to stay. And we stayed and they made us this fantastic spread. So we went from the most wholesomely degenerate, like night of my life, to just the most wholesome night of our lives. These people were so sweet. We had so much kindness from all of them. It was awesome. And right here is the last night on the Winnipeg River. And way over there in the sunset is Lake Winnipeg. I don't know how many of you folks were Hobbit fans, but if you were likening this trip of ours to the Hobbit, this is pretty much the Battle of Five Armies. This is the big, the bad, the ugly, right? Um, although there were polar bears maybe on this trip, although there was white water, although there was floods, Lake Winnipeg was weighing the heaviest, at least in my heart, the whole trip. And a lot of us agreed on that fact, just because it's known to be really big, really unpredictable, and, and picks up really large. So here's our first morning on Lake Winnipeg. We woke up at 3 a.m. to try to beat the wind. And by about 7 a.m., we were in camp. Um, we just decided it was too choppy. Later in the trip, we paddled on bigger waves, but it was kind of a rude awakening for us. We started on Lake Winnipeg. We're feeling good really quickly. It got just really, really, really gnarly. Lake Winnipeg's really shallow. So people liken it to a cookie tray, right? And when you shake a cookie tray, those waves just build really quick. The other thing is it has two halves. The north basin is way bigger than the south basin. There's a choke point in the middle. So depending on what way the wind's coming, all that water from the north basin gets forced to that choke point and the south basin rises kind of exponentially because of that. But like most of our nights on Lake Winnipeg, we waited around that spit of rock as the waters kept rising towards we were trying to stay dry. And we just said, well, we're just going to wait till we can paddle again. And we're just, we just have to paddle when we can paddle. So that night we got back on the water. We had to get comfortable riding roller coaster waves. Um, you know, and folks on the ocean may understand that more than we did at the time that swells were okay, right? They weren't capping. So it was okay. You just had to get comfortable going up, up, up. Oh, down, down, down. Okay. Up, 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 down, down, down. And again, had some beautiful campsites because we put up with that. The next couple of photos are just showing the size, trying to show the size of Lake Winnipeg and also showing like we did in the Boundary Waters, we fell back to our old youth guiding habits that if it's windy, you know what you do? Try to wake up earlier and beat the wind. And again, people, this man's name was Reg Samard and we'll just tell a little bit about Reg because he's a really cool guy. 
again, we met this woman at this museum who said, oh, well, you guys should have real bannock and fish. My cousin will meet you on Lake Winnipeg. And again, we go, all right, sure, sure. Your cousin will meet us on Lake Winnipeg somewhere. All right. And sure enough, Reg was uh, emailing us and trying to find us. And we finally found him. And he brought us this fantastic dinner of fish and bannock. Turns out what Reg does, other than work for Manitoba Hydro, like everybody, everybody works for Manitoba Hydro. It seemed like it seemed like it was a, a reoccurring joke. But Reg was also part of, if you guys look up the Morningstar project, there's a silica sand mine on lakes or Lake Winnipeg or is going to be a silica sand mine. And Reg is part of a, a group that is trying to stop it. So they have a ceremonial fire that's going 24-7 so the mining company can't start. And he's really, really passionate about it, as you shared with us, because the mining company did not inform the locals about it. They kind of paid off some folks in the council. Um, so they wouldn't have to have a vote on it with the people that lived there. And his son who worked with Silicon Sands said, dad, you can't do it. Like people are going to die. Um, and so Reg kind of got in touch with this group that was doing the ceremonial fire. So the food we had actually was like leftover from a uh, event they had with that fire. So really, really interesting person. And that's what happens. You know, you meet interesting people because interesting people want to meet interesting people. Lake Winnipeg also let it gave us a lot of moose. Again, those wilderness trips, right? Um, the Northwoods will provide when you go through hard stuff, you're often rewarded, you know, and that's that's always the, the lure of those trips. This was a pretty classic thing for us. We paddle as far as we could until the weather got bad and then we'd, we'd get off and discuss what we were gonna do and then get back on. Often that meant that we'd be paddling right into sunset a couple nights. Um, and again, this is just showing the scope of that lake. I mean, it was just huge. This was our biggest crossing of Blood Vein Bay. Blood Vein Bay is about six and a half miles long. And we waited till 7 p.m. to start it because we had a wind forecast and the wind wasn't gonna die down until seven. We got out there at seven and it was actually going pretty good. Sorry about that. It was actually going pretty good. Um, there's still some really big choppers and there's this, this legend on Lake Winnipeg called the Seven Witches and the Seven Sisters. And the Seven Sisters is the waves will come from all directions, including below. I didn't really believe that for a long time until we were crossing Blood Vein Bay. And you'd be paddling, you'd just be normal swells, okay, we know what we're doing. And then out of nowhere, this pocket of waves coming from all over would happen. And you're like, all right, we're going to miss that. Then one would happen over here. Okay, we're going to miss that. Um, and we all thought we were doing good. We were getting more in the middle. And we looked back and our, our canoe with Elijah and the hunter just got enveloped in waves. And we thought, that's it, they're gone. And then boop, they popped out the other side and just kept going. But everybody was just shocked. I mean, Lake Winnipeg was phenomenal. We crossed Blood Vein Bay and who did we find but the only other person we know of at the time paddling to the bay. This woman started in Minneapolis and she paddled the, um, the canoeing with the Cree route or the Hudson Bay bound route. We did not plan on meeting her. We just got to an abandoned fishing village with one light on and it was hers. We ended up staying with her for two weeks. We were really fortunate she had some connections with local fishermen that helped us get some resupplies. And here we are, those resupplies on Lake Winnipeg were a little hectic because we'd maybe help get a ride in town or paddle town, get a of our food, go to a remote island and try to repack it all for the lake. The lake changed a lot on the way too, you know. Um, as you can tell, we're as far back as we can from the water because the water level could rise so much overnight. This was our last morning on the lake. We got really lucky. It took us 14 days to get across Winnipeg. We talked to folks who got stuck on Winnipeg for 14 days, like in one spot or could not move because of the weather. And the only reason I think we were able to go across the 14 days was one, luck. We got really lucky with weather. Two, the spray skirts helped tremendously. If we didn't have spray skirts, I don't think we would have paddled half the time we did. And three, we woke up early and we, we paddled when we could. So... That night, we were not supposed to get off Lake Winnipeg, but the weather was good. And we were all, we were just, you know, we had 25 miles by lunch. We decided, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Got later and later, and this cloud started looking nasty. We thought, we're so close. Let's get off this lake. So we finally, at we we landed at the end of Lake Winnipeg at about 7, oh, it was dark, so it must have been like 9, 10 p.m. Um, and that night, we're really happy we got off the lake because it was a huge hailstorm. It actually collapsed the kayaker's tent. Um, dented the paddles and some of the pieces of the canoe. Um, and if we were where we were supposed to be that night, it would have been an island with no trees and completely unprotected. So as a little bit of a recovery from the 54 mile day to get off Lake Winnipeg, we had a little layover rendezvous. We made some bread. This was at just a remote abandoned cabin. 
Um, and there's a little bit of the, the rule of the North is as long as you don't break anything, you can, you know, use what you need to use. So we were using these pallets as a table, made some breadsticks, carved some spoons, and then we're on our way again. And here we are paddling off of Lake Winnipeg officially into York, sorry, into Norway House. Norway House was a Cree nation settlement. It was really, really interesting about Norway House, um, where the people were just amazing. So we got there at the exact right time. Norway House was just a little ways off Lake Winnipeg, up the Nelson River, just a little bit. Um, and every year they have this big festival called York Boat Days. And York Boats were these giant metal ore boats that these, these, uh, these fur traders would paddle from Winnipeg City up to York Factory where we were ending. And they would stop in, in Norway House to repackage some furs. So when we were in Norway House, we happened to be there exactly the same day as the World Championship Finals for York Boat Racing. So folks would come from all over this area. They would fly in from the other communities. They'd boat in from the other communities. And every morning, they'd have a giant um, community breakfast for anybody who was there. But I really thought what was fun about this was just like the church breakfast in the Lutheran churches in Hibbing. But, uh, but it was all outside, and all these old ladies were just cooking and having a great time. Oh, can I take your picture? Oh, Absolutely. Um, and the people were just phenomenal. They gave us free t-shirts. They, uh, they took us in a pontoon to, to watch the races. Um, they were just so, 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 so welcoming. And it was such a cool thing to be a part of because these boats were, were phenomenal. After paddling our 17 foot canoes for a month and a half, these, uh, these nine, 10 women were paddling these giant, what, 20 foot long aluminum boats, not made for, for speed, made for hauling furs. And the waves were so choppy, I felt uncomfortable in, a, in the pontoon boat that they shortened the race. So it was only like a 10 mile race instead of what it usually is. And we were pretty lucky we were there the year that Norway House won. It was a huge upset. Um, they had been runner up for the last like five, six years and they took back their title. And they invited us to their awards ceremony. And after they gave the awards away and everybody in York, Norway House has done York boat paddling and racing. So there was divisions for three-year-olds all the way up to there was the master's division of 70-year-olds. And they said everybody had raced at least once. Um, and we saw the women's team who had won that year get their, their trophies. And it was a really cool moment. And then they said, and in the back, there are six paddlers from Minnesota. We just want to wish them well and, and everybody, you know, uh, greet them on your way. So the amount of warmth we experienced was just phenomenal. Um, sadly, we had to leave. After Norway House, the scenery changed again. Um, this is the Itchy Mamish River. In Norway House, we asked these two old guys, what does Itchy Mamish mean in, in Cree? And they go, oh, it means uh, little river. And then they laughed. And we're like, what does that mean? And they go, because it's not little. And we're like, okay, okay. And one of them goes, oh, no, it means river that flows both ways. And so what it is, is it's this river that connects the Nelson River watershed to the Hayes watershed. Depending on the water level, apparently it can flow both ways. We had to paddle up it. Um, but it was a small, beautiful, windy river. What happens when you go up a small, beautiful, windy river? Good answer. You see a lot of beaver dams, and you get to push over a lot of beaver dams. And the historical counts of the Yorkmen had the same exact problem. And their big, big wooden rowboats, they just tried to blow right through them. And often that would just be more work than it took. After the Itchy Mamish, we finally got on the Hayes River. We started approaching our first real northern rapids, right? Winnipeg River, big high volume, kind of straight shot. Uh, the haze was where you know the real rapids started for us, so we felt. This is how it went. The first rapid is called Hell's Gate. Um, we had a chart for it. You know, we scouted as much as we could. Okay, this is easy. We're gonna, you know, there's a ledge on the left, so we're gonna kind of stay river right. We got it. Everybody got it. Okay, me and Chrissy got through, and then these two came through a long time later like a long time later, which means something happened. Uh, this is how that went. They cracked the bottom because they went over the ledge on the class one that we knew about. But like I said, it was a big learning trip for all of us. And this canoe was like 10, 15 years old and not a whitewater canoe. Luckily, it was a great excuse to lay over at a beautiful site to fix the canoe, do some fishing and, and uh, go swimming. So it all turned out okay. The haze also brought those remote moments where you saw a moose and we saw 15 moose on the trip, I think only two black bears and a couple wolves. Um, and it was just phenomenal. The haze was officially the northern part of our trip. With the haze came that white water, like I was saying, and came practice for white water on some of our campsites were by Little Rapids. And with practice for white water came that itch to keep running stuff, um, which on a remote trip can be a dangerous thing to have. This was our, our first, what we thought like beautiful, beautiful Northern Lights on Oxford Lake before our last resupply of the trip. 
Here we are paddling into Oxford House, another Cree Nation community. Um, it's a fly-in only community unless it's the winter. In the winter, they have winter roads that come in and out of it. Um, and so that was our last resupply that we had. We picked food up there for 17 days, I think, to the end of the trip. And here we are at Robinson Falls. And this started uh, the other really nerve-wracking part of the trip for, uh, for me because I was responsible for the gear on this trip. Um, this was the beginning of what they called the 50 kilometers of nonstop rapids. And my whole job and dreams and hopes were that those two Kevlar canoes would make it through the 50 kilometers of nonstop rapids. We had plenty of warnings along the way to keep ourselves in the right mindset. This was a canoe left by um, these two German folks. Uh, if you Google, and I, I apologize, I'm going to uh, swear a little bit here, but if you Google Ricky, Mickey Mouse rat shit canoe, this story will come up. Sir, so absolutely, that's the name of the article. Long story short, they ran a class five ledge in a canoe that had a square stern and bulbs on the side for some reason, and maybe a foot of draft. It was ridiculous. Um, and we also uh, lined past the canoe that was pinned. And if you look closely here, two separate people had tried Z drags to pull it off the rock so they could use it. We heard the story about this canoe later. And the story was that um, the folks got airlifted out. They were getting pretty hypothermic. They sent their spot device and, and got picked up. Uh, so seeing those two reminders and knowing those stories, we made a plan. A, if anybody felt uncomfortable, we wouldn't do it. B, if we could portage, we'd portage. We were pretty good at portaging. That's what we all had a lot of experience with. If we couldn't portage, we'd line. And we would, lining is fun and a kind of an art of its own. And if we absolutely couldn't line, or if it just started looking really fun, we would run it. And of course, the more comfortable we got and the more practice we got with the more we would run. Um, maybe we ran some stuff we shouldn't have with our experience, but you know, that whitewater kind of grabs you. And it was just so fun um, to be learning on a trip like this. Uh, we learned a lot, like I said, we learned so much on this trip. Um, and here we go, just more and more fantastic Northern Whitewater. For about 50 kilometers, we were only here for about three, four days in the serious section. And then we got to White Mud Falls and White Mud Falls was a huge relief. White Mud Falls is the end of the rapids on the Hayes River. Um, so for, for us and for me, it meant that when we got there and those two beat up Kevlar canoes got pulled ashore um, that we did it, right? For God's sakes, I could, we, can, we can tie some logs together to make it to the end at this point. For God's sakes, we'll float in the packs of that what it takes, right? But the canoes got to this point and we didn't have to make a birch bark canoe. I was so worried and coping and kind of planning on doing that. Um, so the fact that that didn't happen uh, was pretty awesome. And again, we got a little bit of a reward. The Northwoods really seems to, uh, to, yeah, to understand when you're needing something. We also joked the entire time on this trip, it was kind of like a TV show. Um, every season would end with a pretty climatic moment, whether it was getting off Lake Winnipeg or starting the Winnipeg River, um, and would set up for the next part of the trip. And for the season finale of the rapids, that night we woke up to the most beautiful northern lights I've still ever seen. And they were just all around us. They were going all night long. Um, you know, we we're far enough north. We didn't have to look north. You looked up, you looked south, you looked east, you looked west, you looked everywhere. And it was hard to keep your eyes shut at a time like this. Our last night, um, you know, this is what Northern trips are about and those big trips are about. You get to see the, yeah, see these pretty amazing, amazing things. Um, White Mud Falls also meant that we were getting close to possible polar bears. Uh, we're really used to dealing with black bears in Northern Minnesota and black bears, you know, maybe they'll take your food. They don't care about you. And they're really easy to scare off, right? Polar bears are really different. Um, everybody we talked to, paddlers, were really serious about polar bear safety. Polar bears are like one of the only known predators to actively hunt humans for food. Um, polar bears are quiet. They can swim usually faster than you can paddle. Uh, they're just pretty, all in all, pretty, pretty spooky. Um, so here we are because we lost our gun. Instead, what we did is we had three cans of bear spray and we got these things called bear bangers. Bear bangers are like firecrackers you shot up in the air, they'd explode and hopefully scare the bear away. So all of us had a, a bear banger and we had three cans of bear spray. So at White Mud Falls, we went ahead and gave a demonstration and read through some notes on polar bear safety. And then the haze changed again. After those white water sections and those rapids and the canyons had opened up in this giant flowing river um, that all the curves and banks you could see all the way down. 
And this was the last couple of days of our trip. And our trip was 88 days long. That's a long time. Some might argue too long, um, but it didn't feel long until the end. And part of that was because it changed so much. And part of that was we all knew each other really well. Um, and you know, as far as a way to spend a summer, I could not think of a better way for that summer. We all grew so much. We all learned so much. We all saw so much. Um, yeah, the, it really truly was worth every one of those days. This is again, one of those last nights. Here we are in polar bear formation, all of our tents set up in a straight line. That's what we were told. So if a polar bear comes in the camp, it's not gonna get stuck between your tents. Um, that night we were sleeping and we just heard these giant footsteps in the water, giant footsteps. Now, it doesn't matter how rational you are. Um, when you think you might get eaten by a polar bear, you forget that moose exists. So everybody immediately went, well, that's a polar bear. Like, this is it. This is when we're going to get eaten. And I got out of the tent and I shined my headlamp and the footsteps stopped. And we waited a second and they turned and they went up into the bushes. We go, well, had to have been a moose. If it wasn't a moose, at least the polar bear is gone. And that next day, this is that, that second to last night where the Fox River comes in. And this is our last night on trail. This is at the confluence of the gods and the Hayes River. So the Hayes grows substantially here. And this is really where the, the polar bear concerns start. Um, and our last night, I don't know, we were all feeling excited. We were all feeling, you know, still a little nervous about what to come. Uh, but, you know, we also all knew there was a lot of trip left. You know, last night on trail, still a long ways from Northern Minnesota. That morning we woke up at 3 a.m. so we could get through the polar bear country as quick as we could and hopefully beat some of the tides at the end of the river at the Hudson Bay. And we were rewarded by paddling our last night under the Northern Lights one more time. A couple hours later, we had a, uh, an occurrence that happened pretty often on the trip. We called it an all poop morning. So when you wake up that early, you don't necessarily want to poop. And a couple hours in, someone's got to poop. And by the time somebody poops and somebody else poops, everybody's got to poop. But we're officially in polar bear country. And at one point we had discussed doing group poops. Um, pretty quickly decided we're not gonna do group poops, we'll be okay. So instead what we did is the person that was pooping had a bear banger and a bear spray. Uh, the on deck pooper or poopist, depending on how you'd like to frame it, had a bear banger. And then I made a spear the night before. Um, and only because I couldn't think of anything else and I'm too ADHD to do nothing. Okay, I could think of something else. When we were in Oxford House, we stayed with this old guy named Dave. And Dave was this old Cree guy and he told us he was so old that uh, he doesn't speak the kind of Cree they spoke in Oxford House. No, no, no. He said, that's, that's bastard Cree. I speak swampy Cree. That's too new. No, no, no. And he said, an old trapper told me. When we told him we didn't have a shotgun, he offered us one. We said, you know, Dave, I don't know. We're not licensed. Like, how we get it back to you? He goes, oh, I have a cousin who's a taxi driver in Thompson. We're like, we don't want to find your cousin in Thompson. Like, I, we're okay. He goes, okay. He said, well, a friend of mine who's a trapper said, if you see a polar bear, you put your hand up like this. We go, why? So you can, why does he flick him off? What's going on? He goes, no, no, you put your hand up like this. And the polar bear turns his head to bite you. And then you can push him over. And we all, you know expected him to laugh we're all waiting like okay and he didn't laugh he looked dead serious he's like yeah so remember so we could have done that um but i decided the spear was the only other thing that came to mind so this is a little ridiculous photo of all of us on a group poop morning again that last day as we got closer to the bay we saw three timber wolves um, and these wolves, man, were just just fantastic it was a reminder that this was not at all our river the wolves were not at all phased that we were there. They saw us, they watched us for a little bit and they went along their business. Um, they knew that they were staying and we were not. Here we are as we're getting closer and closer to our bay, just trying to savor the last couple moments, you know, on this trip. <clears throat> there is our first sight of the Hudson Bay way out in the distance that's when we first start seeing it now this whole last couple hours every single rock looked like a polar bear every single one you'd have to watch as you paddle past it and you're just so nervous so nervous we got closer and as soon as we saw the bay that all melted away i mean it just immediately it was this realization of what we had accomplished but it was not a sense of satisfaction i'll talk about that in a little bit here 
as we paddled on, we started seeing York Factory up here in the distance, this big building, this, this, the oldest wooden building on permafrost, uh, at least in Canada, if not the world. And in front of this building was a white figure pacing back and forth and back and forth. I swear to God, we all thought it was a polar bear waiting to eat us. We go, so we make it all the way to the end and it's waiting at the dock for us. And it's back and forth. We go, polar bear wouldn't pace. That doesn't make sense. So he said, well, it's either a person wearing all white, which is just kind of mean, or it's a polar bear just getting so psyched up to eat us. It's doing push-ups, it's running around, it's getting in shape. So when we get there, it can have its snack. And lo and behold, it was a guy mowing the lawn in an all white suit. Not what we expected to see, you know, uh, the most remote part of our trip, 1200 miles away from our start. Um, and here they are, the folks that were working there met us. Um, and then sure enough, they were all carrying shotguns around with them because of polar bears. They were really awesome folks. Again, they showed us this historic site. Um, you know, they helped us celebrate our achievement and it was just such a cool, awesome feeling to be there. Um, although not all of us saw a polar bear as we were walking, we did see these polar bear beds where polar bears were sleeping. The man in the picture before his name is Josh. Josh was leading, was in like the back actually as we were walking towards these beds. We get closer with, hey, slow down up there. <laughs> what do you mean, Josh? Josh is from Churchill, Manitoba, the polar bear capital of the world. Josh goes, well, there are polar bears sleeping up there a couple of days ago. Why aren't you in front, Josh? You got the shotgun. Come on, man. And sure enough, this was the remnants, a lot like a deer bed. Um, here we are trying to celebrate as best we can, finally making it to the York factory on Hudson Bay. It was a really, really, really satisfying moment. Part of the York factory lure is they brand your paddle if you paddle there. The, the YF brand they used to put on all the, uh, the boxes of furs going out into the big ships to sail across to England to be turned into beaver hats. Um, and if you paddle there, it's, it's kind of tradition, you also get your paddle branded with YF. I made all these paddles, fun fact too. Um, so it was really satisfying for me to see all the paddles hold up throughout the whole trip and make it to the end. Uh, but like I said, there wasn't a sense of satisfaction as in completion. We felt good, we felt so happy with what we accomplished, but immediately we all wanted to do more. None of us thought that was the end. You know, we thought we were just scratching the surface of our Northern exposure. Um, Cause once you paddle in a place like that, you know, it just really gets on you and to you. It's such an amazing way to live, right? You see so many amazing things. And as long as your body can put up with it and you have a group of people to go with, you just don't want to stop going. But the trip was not over. There's still a lot of adventure to have. We had to get out of York Factory, two ways out of York Factory. You either have to fly or you get a jet boat. Um, we took the jet boat because it was a lot cheaper. And again, only by the fact that we, a lot of friends donated to us to be able to, to do this trip. Um, the jet boat's driver's name was, was Clint and his buddy uh, Grizz is in the boat there, the little wood canvas canoe. Grizz took our friend Josh and they went up the river to drop that canoe off for a moose camp that was coming later. Um, and on that trip, Josh saw a polar bear. So officially one polar bear was seen on the trip, but just by Grizz and Josh. Um, and here they are going off on their little side quest to see a polar bear unexpectedly. But we took that jet boat up the, the rest of the way on the Hayes River, around the tip of the bay, up the Nelson River, up a class five rapid up the Nelson, so we could get to Gillum, Manitoba. Gillum is another city that's only there for the hydro dams that are on the Nelson River. Really, really big, stunning hydro dams. And sure enough, in Gillum, Manitoba was Trent all the way from Great Falls meeting us and letting us stay in his house and fed us amazing food and drove us to the Gillum train station that night. Uh, I told you that Dave offered us a shotgun and we didn't want to bring it because, you know, we don't know what to do with somebody else's gun. We're not going to bring, we're from America. You can't do that on a, you can't bring that on a train. We're unlicensed. And we get to the train and we're loading the train way chiller than we expect. Turns out Northern laws seem a little bit different. As we were loading the train into the far right, you can see all the paddles are wrapped up so they wouldn't get damaged on the ride, right? And as we were passing them up to get loaded on the train, we heard one worker turn to the other and say, are those guns or paddles? I don't know, and just put them down. And so like, oh, so I, I guess Dave was right. Maybe he was right about this too, I don't know. We decided to go to Churchill on our trip, just by the train, because when you're that far north, you know, um, man, we, we just wanted to go and see it. And on the train, again, you meet interesting people because interesting people want to meet you. And this is Judy. 
Judy is a woman from Nudavit originally, the province north of Manitoba. And Judy was talking on the train and we were talking to her um, and she was whistling too on the train. It was like six in the morning. She goes, oh, I'm so excited. My sister is going to be here. Who are you guys? Well, Judy, and we told her and she goes, you guys should come over for breakfast. Judy, didn't you say you have to go to bingo? Oh, I don't care anymore. I don't care. I want to surprise my husband by bringing six children home. And so sure enough, we knock on her door and we're carrying all of her bags. Uh, and Mohammed was very <laughs> surprised to see us. A, a canoe trip these guys took. <laughs> but uh, they... Mohammed was a fantastic cook and they made us a beautiful breakfast and invited us back for dinner and gave us Arctic char that her sister brought from Nudavik. And here they are. Mohammed was from Morocco and, and uh, Judy was from Nudavik. So however they met, it was an interesting story. Um, Judy was also an old church lady and kind of also a weed dealer, but we might not have time for that story. But you're at the Hudson Bay. You got to jump in the Hudson Bay, right? There we were in Churchill, Manitoba. We told somebody we're going to jump in and they said, yeah, I'm not going to stop you. And I said, you couldn't if you tried. For God's sakes, you come all that way. You've got to do it. And here we are. We jump in. Here's the after. We got christened in the bay. And it was just an amazing feeling um, to see. Also, all these small northern communities were so interesting. You know, the landscape that we paddled through was interesting. And then the people we met were interesting. After a two-day ride on the train, we were in Winnipeg and one more portage through a populated area. And there was my mother again, bless her heart, to help us out. Uh, when my mom dropped us off at Grand Portage, again, the adventure's not over. She dropped us off in Grand Portage with a six canoe canoe trailer to put all of our canoes on, all of our gear in. Um, and it felt like it barely fit. She showed up in Winnipeg with this trailer uh, and the van and she goes, and two eight foot two by fours, zip ties and a saw and a tape measure and said, trust me, it'll work. And so we sat there in the parking lot of the train station, zip tying these boards onto this trailer, cutting them to length, tying on our canoes, making sure everything fit. And it, it did work to Doris's credit. She was not wrong. We drove back to Minnesota. This was the last time we were all together. We were saying goodbye to Elijah. He had the first, uh, the first exit. I know this has been a long presentation. I, I thank you folks for hanging in. Very soon we'll have questions. Um, but again, I just want to reiterate, you know, for me, this trip was a great growing experience. It's the longest trip any of us had done. It's the most white water any of us had done. It was the most remote we have ever been. Um, we all learned so much. We all became really close friends. Uh, and I think that we all got the itch to keep doing trips especially Northern trips, the beauty of, of the North. And I just was at a symposium called the Far North Symposium in Minneapolis. Um, as folks have done 30, 40 Arctic trips. Um, and, you know, it was really cool to be there and see those stories and the lure of the Northern trips is it really is a different place, a different land, but still your skills transfer, right? The skills you learn on week long trips, um, especially when you're working with other people, working with kids, um, you know, those skills of kind of how to manage a group, how to manage yourself, how to keep in good spirits, you can use to get through something that you kind of didn't think you would. So uh, this is a, a sketch that Elijah made before the trip when we were talking about it. We, we thought we were joking, right? When we said, do you want to paddle the Hudson Bay? Yeah, and within an hour, we had commitments from everybody but him. He was the last one to join because he wasn't there yet. So we left a note in his welcome bag at the place we were all working that said, do you want to paddle to the Hudson Bay this summer? He got there, he got his bag, and he said, well, I think I have a job. And then an hour later, he said, I'm in. And this was the first sketch he made for the trip, I think. And it was his kind of vision of the, uh, you know, the lure, the history, the, the imagination kind of running wild. And I, I think, although we didn't see a narwhal, um, you know, that exactly is how we felt. So thank you folks for listening. Um, if, I don't know if there's time for questions, but if there's any questions, I'd love to, to talk more. I'm really, I like talking a lot. Some people say too much. Um, now it might be hard to do, so if people have questions, maybe put them in a chat, maybe unmute yourself and we'll just try not to talk over folks. How are we doing on time? Yeah, that's certainly fine. We can definitely take a few minutes and see if there are any, any questions. It's okay if there's no questions too. I know I talk a lot. Okay. Um, Scott wants to know how the bugs were. Oh, they were, you know, they were awful at the beginning and then they weren't that bad. Everybody says the bugs are worse up north and it's true because there's just a lot of swamp. But with those flood waters were like the worst mosquitoes and the worst, um, 
black flies that, that I had seen in Minnesota. And I, um, yeah, it was really, really actually shockingly bad. I've never used the bug net. I grew up, we never used bug dope. My mom was insistent on that bug spray DEET. Um, and so, so for, you know, we went on a Quetico trip every year. I guided for six years, never used bug spray, never wore a head net. That trip, I wore my head net a lot and we brought a bug shelter and I'm really happy that we did. That definitely helped from going crazy. Were there any uh, physical ailments or challenges on the trip? You know, again, we got really lucky. The biggest injury we had is Josh kind of threw his back out for two days, but we were able to, um, we were with the kayaker. So actually we borrowed her paddle. And I paddled him solo in the, in the canoe for a while. And then we had, yeah, a little bit of poison ivy and one foot cut, but otherwise not nothing that bad. And really we credit to that just the fact that, A, we got lucky and B, that the six of us all had really level heads and we were able to talk about our decisions. We, we made a, a, a expedition contract at the beginning of the trip, kind of outlining everybody's um, expectations and more importantly, everybody's kind of go, no go points, right? As far as what we were comfortable with and that helped a lot. But yeah, well, thank you folks so much for listening. Um, yeah, I really, really appreciate it. It's really awesome to, to talk to people who are interested about paddling period, especially with the rivers and, and lakes still frozen here. It's a good piece of excitement and motivation. Thanks a lot for sharing, Amos. There's a couple of uh, uh, kudos in the chat. Hope you're seeing that from people. Um, we appreciate it. And thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. Awesome. Bye, you guys. Really great talk. All Is right. that Theo Rivard? Great to see. Thank you. Luke's pal is here, we think. Bye, you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.